I give you Les Leopold. Thank you for the very gracious uh, introductions and the, all the hosting that you've been doing. So the first question is, how big is the pay gap between the top 100 CEOs and the average worker in the United States now? Any ideas? When you ask the American people in a survey what they think the gap is, they say about 45 to 1. Okay. If you ask them what they think it ought to be, a strong Democrat will say 5 to 1. A strong Republican will say 12 to 1 for an average of 7 to 1. So they think it's 45 to 1. They'd like it to be about 7 to 1. Let's take a look at what it is. Well, the American people were right in 1970. Basically, the American people think it's 1970. It's 45 to 1. Watch what's happened since 1970. 1980, 1990, 2010. We're jumping to 2014. It was 844 to 1. One home for you, 844 for them. I cannot wrap my mind around 844 homes compared to one. You know, we have two cars. That would be 1,688 cars. You're talking about an extreme, extreme gap. So people want it to be 7 to 1. If they knew it was 844 to 1, you might have a revolt in this country. They think it's here. So we are trying to introduce into the American dialogue the concept of runaway inequality. This is the only chart that's going to be on your final exam tonight. So I want you to pay close attention to it. Because this is, helps us tell the story of what happens. This top line, this tr the chart from 1947, which you can't see in the back row, and you probably can't see it in the front row. 1947 all the way up till today. And this is productivity in the United States. Does anybody know how productivity is defined? It's kind of a technical term. It's output, the total goods and services produced in the economy, divided by the hours of labor. Not by how much labor is paid, just by how much is produced per hour. So it's a very good measure uh, of our uh, productive capacity. It tends to be the case that the countries that have rising productivity year after year after year, have the most uh, ability to uh, take care of their own people because product productivity allows you to produce a lot of goods and services. So it is the measure, the sum total of our technology, our educational system, our physical infrastructure, uh, uh, the, the skills of our workforce, all that comes together to produce uh, productivity. So as you can see from 1947 till today, uh, productivity has gone up virtually in every year. A couple of years it was flat and then it shot up again. We, we, we produce almost three times as much per hour of labor as we did in 1947. And we have tens of millions of more workers. All right, so that's, that's the first little technical thing you're getting tonight. So what's the big deal? Here's the second line. Average weekly wages of the non-supervisory and production worker, that's 85% of all working people, so uh, what you can see is from 1947 until the mid-late 1970s, when productivity went up, so did the average real wage. Real meaning buying power after you take out the impact of inflation, which you could really buy. You could see that from 47 until the mid-1970s, uh, uh, when productivity went up, so did the average real wage. And those people who are my age might remember that your families were probably doing a little bit better every year. And if you're older than me, you might remember that you were doing even better in the 50s. And this was pretty much covered all working people saw their real wages go up. And all of a sudden, the two lines pulled apart. I mean, really pulled apart. Why did that happen? If we understand why it happened, we have the key uh, to runaway inequality. Let me, let me just point out something here. You know how much the gap is between these two lines? A couple of trillion dollars of money that used to go to working people that's now going to someplace else. Imagine for a second your paychecks. Close your eyes and look at that lovely line, your paycheck. Double it. That's what would have happened if that iron law wasn't repealed, if wages continued to rise. Your wage would be double what it is today, or you'd be getting the same amount of money working half the hours. Half the hours for the same money.
I did, frankly, I wrote two books on finance uh, before this one, and I didn't have it right. I didn't really understand what happened until I came across a study by the International Labor Organization, which is, uh, was set up by the UN after World War II, and it, uh, it has a bunch of labor economists, and they, they work out of Switzerland, and they do these great studies, which are not that easy to understand, but if you read them four or five times, which I had to, it started to make sense. So here's what they came up with. They tested the usual suspects, and they found that technology, uh, they, they looked at the, why the wages went flat. That's what they were concerned with. And they looked at 70 developed nations to try to figure out why they went flat in slightly different ways in different countries. So they said 10% of the problem was technology, not 100% or 80% or what the media says these days. 10%. Globalization, big, bad globalization, 19%. Attacks on labor and cutbacks in social spending, 25%. And then the biggest cause, as my colleague here said, uh, something called financialization. The countries that had the biggest financial sectors, the biggest Wall Street type operations, had the most inequality. It was that simple. So there's something about Wall Street that has something to do with rising inequality. What was it? So the next thing we did is our researchers, our big research team, me and one other guy, we went diving into this and we looked at the wages on, uh, the in the financial sector versus the wages everywhere else. Here are the financial incomes rising and then all of a sudden they go through the roof and here's, it, here's every place else in the economy that's not related to Wall Street, they stay flat. I go, whoa, look at this picture. It looks just like our productivity wage chart. We've got two charts that look the same. Usually this means that they're connected. We don't know if this is causing that or that is causing this or something else is causing both of them, but it gives us a clue that the money went somehow into the financial sector. They certainly benefited from it. How did that happen? After finance was deregulated around 1980, there's a group of people, then they had always been around, called corporate raiders, that saw their opening. They saw that they could buy up companies using borrowed money. And so what? It sounds like that's a big deal. Well, here's what they did. By the way, this was not really permitted before the late 70s uh, and 1980 because they, he, they were so tightly controlled. So first what they did is they took, as soon as they would buy a company, they took a special dividend back for themselves. So it'd be like, you know, you buy a house and the house gives you back your down payment. Wouldn't that be nice? You buy the house, the house gives you back a down payment, a special dividend. Mitt Romney and Bain Capital were famous for doing this. Close the deal, give yourself back a special dividend. All right. You give some to the CEOs and the bankers that help put the deal together, and then you make the whole company pay it back. The debt's not on your shoulder. How many people here have bought a car with a car loan? Who pays back the loan, you or the car? <laughs> no, seriously. If you bought Avis or Hertz, Avis or Hertz would pay back the loan, not you. That was the beauty of these uh, uh, corporate uh, takeovers. And of course, once people saw this, that this was going to work and no one was going to stop them, it happened again and again and again. And virtually every company that any of you have ever worked for has gone through this. All right, so now, now you got a problem. You just took over Hertz or Avis or General Mills or whatever, and you want to get as much wealth out of this. You're, you're the big investor. You want, to get, you want to suck the wealth out of the company. How do you do that? Well, what you got to do is you need a straw boss. You need somebody that's going to help you do that on the inside of the company. You don't have time to do that because you're going to buy a bunch of companies. You want somebody else in there, and that person's going to be the CEO and the top officers. So to put them on your wavelength, you got to change the way they're paid. Back in 1980 or before, 95% of a CEO's pay was salary and bonuses, and about 5% were stock incentives. They changed that. They increased the amount of stock incentives from almost nothing in 1980 to, this is now all the top 500, not 100, to at least $9, $10 million a year on average, some in the hundreds of millions. Then, uh, today, 5% of a, the average CEO's salary, uh, salary and bonuses, 5% of their pay is salary and bonuses. That's it, 5%. 
The rest, or just about all the rest, are stock incentives. All right, now think about this for a second. I, I know we got some CEO material in the room. Think about it. You're a CEO. Almost all your pay is stock incentives. You go to work the next day. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to make the value of the stock go up. Of course you are. You're not, you didn't take the job to be an altruist. You want the stock to go up. How? How do you make the stock go up? How do you do it? Stop. The people that read the book, keep your hand down. Outsourcing, that's one. What else? Efficiencies. What else? You want to make that stock go up. You need strategies to milk the company. And they came up with an incredible one that was illegal before they came up with it, <laughs> or, or virtually illegal. Uh, we call it stock manipulation. They took the company's money, went into the stock market, and bought back the company's own shares. Now, well, what is? What does that do? Let's pause for a second. Assume, what's your name? James. James and I own a million dollar company and 50-50 ownership. He's got one share and I've got one share. Each share is worth $500,000. James decides he's going to uh, buy me out. So I'm gone. My share's gone. Now James has owns the company. His share is now worth a million dollars. He's reduced the number of owners. The remaining owner, that share is going to be more valuable. This works even with millions of shares. Also, if you're going to buy millions of dollars worth of shares, you have to go into the market and bid up the price just a little bit. Well, lo and behold, if you manipulate the price, it goes up. The value of your stock incentives go up. You get richer as the CEO. And of course, the investor gets richer as well and they can pull out, as soon as the stock goes up, they can start selling shares and make a quick gain. Well, you, you, you think this is just a little sideshow? This is the main event of corporate America. Here's the, the profits of all the companies in the, four, in the uh, uh, Standard & Poor's, the 500 biggest companies. As, this is what percent of their profits they use for stock buybacks. 2% in 1981. They allowed a little bit. Then they changed the rule. By 2007, by the time of the crash, 75% of all corporate profits went to stock buybacks. Every dollar that they can save at work, 75 cents, went to stock buybacks. And some companies went over 100%. How did they do that? Who said that? Borrow money. They would load more debt onto the company, use that money to buy back, uh, buy back more than 100% of their profits. Why? Because that's what they do when they go to work. They look at the, the value of, the, of their uh, stock, and they want to make it go up. That's how they get paid. All across the board. This is modern corporate America. Now watch what this does. You need money to do this. So you downsize through layoffs, you ship production abroad, you sell off product lines and divisions, you speed up production, you raid the pension funds or you discontinue them, you cut wages and benefits, you change the whole corporate culture from retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. That is the name of the game. This is so bad that even the Wall Street Journal complains about the cuts in research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. They said, hey, they're not making new products because they're cutting down their R&D to do stock buybacks. Straight out of the Wall Street Journal. Not exactly a radical uh, uh, newspaper. All right, so this starts, this whole process that we just saw here, this is what we call financial strip mining. This is the strip mining of corporate America to, to siphon out the wealth and put it into their own pockets. And this helps explain why average real wages stagnate, why financial and CEO income skyrocket, why good jobs and benefits are under pressure and declining, et cetera. If it only hit every corporation, it would be a sad event. 
But unfortunately, it's even worse. It's hitting all of us. So if, if you're still with me, raise your hand if you're sleeping. <laughs> all right, if you're still with me, uh, let me show you the impact of financial strip mining on the rest of us. The first thing that happens is they, when they load up these companies with debt, it changes the picture. This is corporate debt in the United States from 1945 till today. Virtually no corporate debt until around 1980 when the financial deregulation took place. And now it's about $8 trillion of corporate debt. Forget about the government debt. The corporate debt is enormous. Now, how many people here have a mortgage? Interest payments on your mortgage are? Deductible. Deductible. So are the interest payments on this. So that means corporate taxes go down. Look at this. They've fallen in half since 1980. So corporations are, are, have reduced their contribution to state and local government by half. We're supposed to have a progressive tax system. The rich are supposed to pay a higher percentage than the poor. And a flat tax would be everybody pays the uh, same percentage. Here's what we have. Because of the rich aren't paying, and corporations aren't paying. Here, here's a perfect progressive tax system, right? This would be the poor down to the rich, 10.4%, 5.4%. This would have the rich paying twice as much as the poor. Uh-uh, other way around. The top 1% is paying half as much as a percentage as the poor in state and local taxes. So that the rich aren't paying, the poor can't pay, the burden falls on the middle, and that's why there's a tax revolt going on all the time. That's why the richest country in the history of the world can't afford anything. Now, this is a very telling one. This is, this is uh, unemployment and underemployment. Underemployment means uh, somebody that has a part-time job that wants a full-time job. This is uh, high school graduates, not dropouts, graduates. 50%, over 50% of black youth are unemployed or underemployed. Latino, 36%. Anglo, 33%. I mean, yes, it's worse for African American uh, uh, youth, but it's bad all the way across the board. You think we would do something about this, right? If there ever was a, a place to do something, it would be right here. High school graduates, they did what we told them to do, stay in school, graduate, and then they can't find a decent job. Here's what we've done. Watch this. This is the prison population from 1910 onward. Let me narrate. 1910, 20, 30, 40, 50s. OK, here comes sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the 1960s. Watch what happens. Whoop. Went up a little bit. 1970s, we were still stoned in the 1970s. <laughs> Didn't go up much. Runaway inequality hits. Watch this. We have the most prisoners in the world. We have the, an absolute number and percentage, more than North Korea, Cuba, Albania, Russia, China. And the average income of somebody going to prison is like $19,000 for African American, $21,000 for Anglo, $20,000 for Hispanic. This is where we put poor kids. This is our war on poverty. This is where we suck up the surplus population we put them in jail. This is a product of runaway inequality. Here's another product. Where's our expert, Dr. K, on uh, opiates? Here's the opiate, popul uh, uh, opiate deaths starting in 1980. Looks a lot like the runaway inequality line. This is how people are coping with, uh, I don't know about you, if you drive through rural areas of America, uh, it looks bad. It looks bad. You know, I just came back from a month in uh, Denmark, and I, I call it 50 shades of middle class. You don't see poor people. You don't see that many uh, wealthy homes. You just see all gradations of middle class, and it just looks prosperous. They don't have runaway inequality there. Anyway, now, now here's the prison population. Here's the, uh, the Wall Street wages. Now, you all heard of Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri? got killed by the cops. And uh, mostly this story is told as pure racial oppression. 
I want to show you the ugly hand of runaway inequality in the picture. There's an incredible study done by the Justice Department. They looked at 21 towns around St. Louis and how they raised their revenue. And they have this thing called fines and forfeitures. That's when the cop stops you, gives you a ticket for something, or you know, finds something to give you a ticket for, drags you into the criminal justice system. Then they find out maybe you owe some money for something else and you have to pay court fees. Well, all these towns raise money that way to close their budgets. Corporations aren't paying, wealthy people aren't paying, they can't tax their people anymore, so they do it this way. And this is Ferguson, Missouri. All the way from 2004 to the crash of 2008, they, they got between 7 and 8% of their revenues from fines and forfeitures. Then along comes the crash, they're, they're stuck, they, they don't have money, so they tell their cops, go out there and double the amount of fines and forfeiture, fines that, that, you know, arrest people on the street. We need double the amount of money. And Michael Brown happened to be on the street and was approached. We don't know exactly what happened, but he ends up dead. But we do know the emphasis to try to arrest people doubled before he was killed. So there's a direct impact between runaway inequality and uh, racial justice and oppression. When you're, and by the way, we think this is happening in thousands of towns across the country. Okay, so what do we do about this mess? And uh, if this was a workshop, we'd be spending a lot of time talking about this, but I'm gonna walk you through uh, 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 some ideas here. First of all, there are two takeaways from this whole talk. The first one is, runaway inequality will not cure itself. There's no magic pendulum swinging back and forth in the economy. Oh, it was just, in, it was better in the 1950s and 60s, then it got bad, now it's gonna get good again. Ain't happening, ain't happening. Doesn't happen that way. Financial strip mining is built into the system now. It is not gonna fix itself. Why should it? So if this is true, it leads to a second takeaway, which is gonna be difficult for us to bear because it makes an enormous responsibility on us. And that is, it's gonna take a massive popular movement to counter runaway inequality, the likes we have not seen in our lifetimes. The, I'm setting the bar high for us because I know what the problem is that we have to deal with. It's a big problem. And what we're doing now isn't working. We've got Black Lives Matter. We've got, here's the CWA Verizon workers on strike. We've got the People's Climate March. We've got the Fight for 15. We've got a lot of stuff going on. But it's all going on separately. It's all in its silos. We want these silos to begin to consider an alternative strategy an alternative strategy built around a common movement around runaway inequality. Do we have any models? Fortunately, we do. Of all places, the populace, which is supposed to be a terrible word, the American populace of the 1880s and 1890s was a phenomenal movement. It was uh, small farmers in the South largely and in the Midwest, black and white, getting totally screwed by Wall Street, the big banks at the time, they, 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 their loans were going under, they were going under, they're losing their farms, they're, their prices are being squeezed, they've got monopolies controlling the railroads, the grain elevators, the stockyards, and, 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 and they built a new movement to take them on. So, here was their organizing strategy. Educate and organize. And then when they were done with that, they organized and educated. They put in the field 6,000, they were falling apart until they put in the field 6,000 educators. 6,000 in the 1880s to go around and explain how Wall Street worked, how they were being strip mined, you know, how, why they needed a, more, a, a different kind of economy that worked for them and not for, not for the fat cats. So, what do we need to do? What, what should we focus on? The first thing is, there are four things. We need a common agenda and a common analysis. This silo stuff has got to kind of like, you know, we gotta make our silos more porous. We gotta be on the same page with a common agenda that holds us together. And we need an analysis. It can't just be, I'll support your issue, you support my issue. Because that'll fall apart. It has to be that those two issues are actually connected. And I think they're connected by runaway inequality. And if we, if we look at runaway inequality and financial strip mining, I think I can connect, connect every issue in this room. All right, the second thing we need is an educational infrastructure. That's my pay grade. 
We can build this. We can build an army of educators. People just like you can learn how to do our workshops. So I think we can build this inf uh, educational infrastructure. Here's where it gets harder. We need a new state, national, local organization dedicated to reversing runaway inequality. I think you can actually start it right here. You, imagine if we had something called Wilmington United and all the different groups represented in this room came together. We can build it, but this is over my pay grade. I represent five people on a good day, assuming the rest of the staff is even listening to me, in New York. I don't represent 600,000 steel workers, or, six, or how many ILA people, or uh, uh, 600,000 communication workers, or even what your organizations here represent. You could come together and form this and become a model for how we break out of our silos. But you won't do that until we conquer the fourth thing, which is we need a new activist identity. No matter what else we are, we can be a racial justice advocate, we can be a clean water advocate, we also have to be movement builders. We have to see ourselves as building a movement powerful enough to reverse runaway inequality, or it can't possibly happen. It's not going to just fall from the sky. We can't just wait for the next Messiah. So, so we have to actually start to believe in ourselves that we can build a movement. And that's not going to happen until we have that identity. So we set up uh, a website, and we started asking people at the, at the end of my articles and the talks, I said, go to the website and sign up if you want to be part of the Runaway Inequality Education Network. And this is what we have. It's about two or three weeks old. And you can see we need more people here. We only got a few, North Carolina. This, is all, this, this has happened since February. This is, un, this is basically unsolicited. This is just from a tagline at the end of my article saying, oh, if you're interested in being a runaway inequality trainer, go to this website. So go to this damn website, <laughs> sign up, and we will help you build a infrastructure in, in Wilmington, in this county, and in this state to support a movement to reverse runaway inequality. We will, build, we will help you build that infrastructure. We will train trainers. If you say, if you put your, if you say yes, there's a, it's a very simple box you fill out, and it says, do you want to be a trainer? Yes. If you do, great. If not, you just get an email every now and then uh, about what we're doing. But we need you. And uh, like I said, usually at the end of these talks, I angle for an applause, because it makes me feel great you know, <laughs> when you guys do it. The game's changed. You want to applaud? Go ahead. But this time, you're applauding for what you're going to do. You're making a commit. When you applaud, you're making commitment to move this idea forward, or nothing's going to happen. It's on us. It's not all these external things. We've been organizing this way for 40 years. It's our responsibility, too. And this is the time to change it. People are hungry for change. Let's help them get it. Thank you very much.